Uh, yeah, first presenter with that. Someone who needs no introduction. <laughs> I don't know why I need no introduction. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone good? Well, I have to say it's an honour to be stood up here at the first GDEVCon, seeing so many faces, so much trust in something that we've tried to put together. Uh, I hope this is a good success for everybody. Um, yes, my name is Richard Thomas. Um, used to work for PTP. Kevin's gone. So it was, uh, it was fantastic to see there uh, how PTP have grown since I left a few years ago. Um, very encouraging. Um, so when I was deciding if I wanted to present here, um, I wondered what I might build a topic on. And something I have to admit that uh, I've never been very educated on is frameworks in LabVIEW. It was something that I hear a lot of people using. I'd heard about the fact that they existed. Um, I think I dabbled in a couple. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of, for example, the NI Actor Framework. I'd heard about that. I tried it. I really didn't get it. So at that point, I figured, I need to work out what this is all about. So I started using frameworks, um, and I thought, I need to understand more about them. And I thought, there's a potential presentation topic in this. So this, GDEVCon is not just about LabVIEW architects. I'm hoping there are people here who are just LabVIEW developers. Um, so this presentation is a little more than entry level, but it's certainly not a deep dive into frameworks. It'll give us an overall summary of what we have out there and what frameworks can do for us. So um, just a quick show of hands, how many people here use a framework now, whether it's one that they've built themselves or one that they've adopted? Oh, that's fantastic. It's about half the room. Um, those people who didn't raise their hands, uh, would you be interested in using a framework and maybe you're just a little intimidated by the concept? Yes. Yeah, great. So I'll be mainly aiming this presentation at that gentleman up there. <laughs> Okay, uh, as Darren mentioned, uh, we like to talk in GDEVCon 1 about um, women in science and engineering. I've picked somebody who may not be a natural choice for this. Um, my background is aerodynamics engineering. So I studied at Leicester University and then Cambridge University, and it is a very male-dominated field. Although at Cambridge, it's actually f uh, it's a better split between genders. But back in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart uh, was, a, was dedicated to the task of becoming a pilot, a very male-dominated field back then. Um, and to be a pilot, you really did need to understand aerodynamics. Uh, and she was, uh, most people know her for um, the first woman to cross the Atlantic solo, I believe. Uh, in the early 1900s. Um, but she was an accomplished aeronautics engineer in a very male-dominated field. Um, and I admire her for that dedication and that strive. Um, and there's a very poignant quote there from her, that women must try to do things as men have tried, and they fail. Their failure must be but a challenge to others. Okay, so the topic... Now, I practiced this last night, and I ran over quite a lot. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through it, but don't let that mean you don't absorb the content. Um, I'd rather miss a little bit at the end than go so fast that you don't hear all of the words. Um, so what is the level? <laughs> huh? I missed that. Bit. Oops. <laughs> yes, it's a common thing, isn't it? So what is a framework? Um, I often find when I ask people, tell me, what, what to you is a LabVIEW framework? I get a completely different answer from different people. You can ask 10 engineers what a framework is. You'll get 10 different answers and an instant argument. It doesn't seem to be a very clear thing. Um, it's almost an abstract concept, the idea of a framework. And although it can exist as code, which makes it a thing, um, pinning down its actual definition seems to be quite hard. So I refer to books. I thought I'd have a look, see what other people have defined it. And uh, the Gang of Four book, it's actually called Design Patterns, but it has a section in it on what frameworks are, and I found that quite useful. Um, 
I don't like giving very academic high level descriptions of what things are because quite often it doesn't mean a great deal. Uh, but unfortunately, I've done exactly that. So this slide has a few things in it um, which may not make sense at first, but I'll try and go through them. Uh, so software framework, typically, it will dictate the architecture of your application. Uh, it will provide for you a predefined static code set that you can use and build upon for your particular application requirements. So if you're building a very large application and you're not sure how the architecture should sit for all of the modules that you need to develop and how they all communicate between themselves, a framework can give you a head start in that. Uh, they can provide actions to divide, define the structure. So by abstractions, I mean, that's where it gets a bit hazy. Um, for those of us who work with classes, we understand what an abstract class is. It's something that you can't instantiate, but it gives you a base on which to build a child class, which provides you with more functionality. Um, think of that in uh, the conceptual phase for your framework you get this abstract concept that defines your architecture. Um, so the framework itself may provide you with uh, an abstract class that defines your module, and then you can create your modules based on that. Um, a framework, because it dictates the architecture, it can actually help you in the design of your code. So if you have a large project that you need to solve, you want to break that down into manageable chunks, areas of responsibility, maybe the hardware, maybe the user interface, uh, maybe there's some file I.O., et cetera. Uh, the framework can help you break that down more easily. So if you're using a framework, you might find that it actually assists you in that, in that process. And because a framework provides you with working backplane uh, or a spine for your code, the architecture that holds it all together, it leaves you to concentrate on the bits that are specific to your problem. I keep walking back to the laptop and I've got this in my hand. How bizarre is that? <laughs> <laughs> and it can also emphasize design reuse. Um, so by breaking up your code into modules, which is a good working practice anyway, um, and using the template structure that is often provided by your framework of choice, uh, you'll find that you're building blocks of code that are very independent testable on their own, um, and by that very nature, migratable. So you might be making sections of code that are much more easy to turn into a reuse block than if you'd uh, developed them in any other format. And in order to help you achieve that, frameworks do often include working templates, and we'll see that as we work through. So I thought an analogy, <laughs> I like analogies, um, we're all love you people, we like to visualize stuff. Consider two totally made up car manufacturers, Ford and Chrysler. Um, these two companies both, both make automobiles, but they're very different types of cars. Here in the UK, Ford makes small and lightweight, three cylinder high efficiency engine cars. Okay, remember it's make believe, don't argue with me. Uh, whereas Chrysler like to make huge seven person people wagons with supercharged engines. Both cars, but both very different. Very different problem domain, but they certainly have um, similar requirements. And both Ford and Chrysler, in this analogy, are looking to construct a brand new state-of-the-art manufacturing facility to make these cars that they want to sell to people like us. So they both go out and they buy themselves a massive factory, and they're looking around and they think to themselves, we obviously need to populate this factory with equipment, gantries, um, conveyor systems, trolleys, we need to be able to provide parts to this, the various assembly lines. Um, this isn't anything that we care about. We just want to build the cars. We are automobile engineers, right? So then they look online, they find uh, an expert in the field of automotive manufacturer, and that expert provides them with an automotive manufacturer framework. So this analogy represents a system that you can buy in that gives you a framework upon which you can build your specific solution. That doesn't really exist, by the way, because if it did, I'd be wearing something <laughs> far more expensive. 
So to continue the analogy, you can see here a production line. And in this production line, there are many stations that have individual responsibilities. They're going to need to talk to each other to make sure that parts are supplied, that they move on to the next station in time. Uh, somewhere over here, you might have a control station, and this is responsible for monitoring all the systems. So you have lots of independent, asynchronous assembly processes that all need to communicate together to make sure that the whole system runs smoothly. And it's the automotive framework analogy here that provides Ford and Chrysler with a head start on that. And their engineers don't need to worry about how it all works. They can focus on what they know best, which is the development of each of the, the parts and the assembly. And they can trust that the framework will take care of the handling of that, the management of it. Did that work, that analogy? Did that help anybody? Yeah? My friend up there gave me a nod, so that's good. <laughs> if you have this argument, discussion, with your 10 engineers about what a framework is, some people will say, well, it's just like a design pattern. Or you can go to the project template and you can get your framework from there. Yeah. That's a Venn diagram with no real meaning, but it does show that there's a level of overlap between the, the, the concepts. Um, a design pattern is very theoretical. It's usually a, a conceptual solution to a common design problem. So because it's quite conceptual, it can be applied to a lot of things, not just software. Um, and they're very, very flexible. So uh, a design pattern doesn't give you a very strict solution. So if you think of some examples like producer consumer loop, that's a design pattern. Um, you could take that produce consumer loop and you could build on it, you could modify it, you could completely re-architect the way that that works. It may not even look like the producer consumer anymore. Um, but you've still got a solution to your particular problem domain. The framework is much bigger than that. Framework, typically in LabVIEW anyway, it's a very large library of reuse code. And it's not modifiable. Typically a framework is solid, it's hard code, you adopt it, and you work by its practices. Now, if there's anyone in here who disagrees with the way I'm expressing this, that's fine, because I understand that there are different ways that you can understand what a framework is. So if anybody strongly disagrees with stuff that I've put up here, please do speak up. Um, but I did get a lot of this information from a few sources, so I guess there are, out there there are different opinions. But typically, they are not modifiable, they define the architecture that you will use, the communication strategy that must be in place to work between all of those modules. But it is extensible, so you're not stuck. Quite often, they're at a high level, they're quite abstract. So um, they'll provide you with a framework, which is your start point, but then you have to build on top of that. And because they're extensible, you can add code. And the benefit of being extensible instead of uh, flexible is your code is additive, so you don't break the stuff that was already there. So um, that means you can take your framework and put your own stuff on top of it. And in LabVIEW, we find that some of the frameworks, uh, they come with some fantastic tools. Uh, and these tools give us huge productivity enhancements. And a project template, in my head, they're, 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 not, they're nothing like frameworks and design patterns. Typically, a project template is a, a bit of LabVIEW code that gives you a head start. It quite often is one implementation of a design pattern theory. So you might get a producer-consumer <laughs> template in the LabVIEW templates. And they're simply provided to accelerate development and promote good practice. Um, so it does reduce the risk of creating errors. Uh, and a lot of people I know recommend starting from a project template just to accelerate your development. And indeed, some of the, the, some of the frameworks that we have available to us in LabVIEW do include with some templates. So it sounds restrictive, it sounds complicated. Believe me, it is. Um, so why should I bother? Well, it's great to see so many hands go up on those people who are using frameworks now. Because there are advantages, of course, to using a framework. So we have familiarity. If you're working with the same framework throughout a lot of your projects, assuming it fits all of your problem domains, then you become accustomed to how that works. 
It makes you a faster developer. You're not starting from a blank VI. Um, and if anyone else you know is using that framework, you can share that with them and they'll be familiar with it. It does speed up development. Proven, the frameworks that we've got available to us, some of them have been in the field for 10 years. Um, they've been developed, continuously upgraded, proven in the field, very good solid code. If you have to try and create your own framework, you probably find you're coming across hidden bugs within it almost every time that you build a new project on it. So you're always bug fixing it. If you use one that's provided it, and it's already been out there for a while, um, it's more solid and robust. Productivity enhancements, I've already briefly touched on that. The tools make things quicker. It's certainly very good for team development. If you're working in a team and you're all working on the same framework, then you can all be creating a module of your own. And the communications technique will be the same. You don't have to worry about one guy using his preferred API and another guy using his own user events API and then someone else uses files to pass information between modules. Nobody does that, right? <laughs> Not anymore, good. <laughs> uh, it makes maintenance easy also as well. So if you deliver a project and then someone else picks it up in a couple of years time, if they're using the same framework, if it's part of your guidelines within your company, then it makes that easier. And typically the use of a framework helps you to adopt good design practice good uh, standard practices in software engineering. And that's never a bad thing. Certainly one of them, DQMH, it promotes the use of testing very heavily. Um, and I found that that was an incredibly useful uh, feature because we'll all say that we appreciate the benefits of testing our code, unit testing, system level testing. And then if you actually get someone in a dark room and put them under a spot lamp, say, how much <laughs> testing do you really do? they'll crumple and they'll own up and say, well, yeah, it was running when I left it. It was working, I'm sure. <laughs> Unit testing, there is no replacement for it, and DQMH makes that a lot easier. Um, and automation, it's related to tools. There's a lot of automated processing that the tools can provide you with. So if you are creating another module and it has to inherit from the framework class and you need a certain structure in your project tree, these tools can script that. It makes that a lot easier. It, prov it reduces the likelihood of you making an error. Um, and it makes it much quicker and less frustrating. So hopefully I've convinced some of you. Questioning, uh, are there any disadvantages? Of course there are. Nothing's ever perfect. There is a learning curve. Some are easier than others. Some of them are really hard. Um, Inflexibility, of course, they dictate to you an architecture and a communication strategy. If you're comfortable having the freedom to do what you want, you'll lose that freedom when you work with a framework. But arguably, the framework's trying to help you. So bear that in mind. Complexity, um, some of these frameworks, they're designed to be used. They're not designed to be dove into. So the developer doesn't necessarily expect you to open up the source to that framework and see how it runs. Some of them are open, which is good, but they are darn complex. Um, and there are design decisions made inside some of these that from looking at the VI, you might not necessarily understand. Um, certainly I've looked inside some of these frameworks and I've completely lost down the rabbit hole. I have no idea what's going on inside there. I just have to trust that the developer knew what he was doing and it, it does work. And the enforced architecture, it doesn't fit every solution. So you may get familiar with one particular framework and uh, become intimately familiar with it, and then you have a new problem, project space, and that framework has to get shoehorned in. Its architecture may not necessarily fit every time. Um, and if you don't like the architecture of a framework, then don't use it. Find another one, make your own. Hopefully you're still convinced. Are we still convinced? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so what's available for us in the LabVIEW space? Bang. I didn't realize there were so many until I started researching for this. Um, there are quite a lot, and that's not a, a complete list. I'm sure people could probably tell me of a few more. Uh, I won't go through them all. Um, ones I have experience with, DQMH from Delacour, the Messenger Library from James Powell. Uh, certainly, I would hope most of us are familiar, familiar with the JKI State Machine. Um, their framework, State Machine Object, is built on top of that. 
Uh, we have the NI Active Framework and the NI Distributed Control and Automation Framework, DCAF. This, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't know enough about, and it looks incredibly powerful. So I'm going to go away from this and look at that in more detail. Uh, I'd heard of Aloha. I've never used it before. Um, some of these I tried to install and work with before this presentation, and I couldn't get off the ground with them. So um, I don't have a great deal of information on all of them. But for those of you who have never used a framework and are wondering, right, so what does it look like to work with a framework in LiveView? How do I take my LiveView project environment and actually start using one of these? Well, this is an example. Um, I'll quickly run through this. This is, um, this LiveView environment has DQMH installed and the Messenger library installed. So to show you an example of DQMH, there's an empty project. Go to the tools menu and you'll find a Della core section, DQMH, and then a whole series of uh, tools available to us. Starting at the top with the new DQMH module, you get a wizard, populate that. This module is going to define one of your components of code. You choose what it's called, where it's going, whether it's a singleton or not, give it an icon, click OK, bang. The scripting provides you instantly with a section of code in a library, and in there, we'll look in a second, but also note, directly underneath it, we have this test VI, which is intrinsically linked to your module to allow you to unit test it. This is very powerful. I like this. So diving into the uh, module library, you'll see that it's automatically created your virtual libraries, your, uh, the private scope of these to make sure they're not used outside the library, and there's one VI on the top level called main. And that is, as you would expect, your module. Now this is DQMH, the Delacore Cube Message Handler. So as you might expect, we have a Cube Message Handler system in here. And all of these VIs are part of the framework. And this whole structure is provided for you. And you do not edit the structure, because the structure is defined. And it allows the tools to maintain uh, your modules for you. So you build into here um, your working code. And if we go back and have a look at the test VI, and that I used and I ran, and you can see that with this test VI, I was able to initialize, show the panel of the module, uh, then hide the panel, show the block diagram, tell it to stop running, just through the buttons that are provided. I didn't do any work here. This gives you an automatic module that works out of the box. All you need to do is add your code that makes it do what you need it to do, and keep updating that test VI so that you can independently test the functionality of your module. The module doesn't work in isolation. You need to be able to talk to it. So the communication strategy is also provided for you. DQMH uses user events. So you go to create new user event. You get this wizard. You provide it. You populate it with whatever it is that you want your communication strategy to be. I'm not going to go into the details because I haven't got enough time. Here I'm just creating a quick message that provides a path. Click OK, boom, you have a VI. You're also given your API calls to allow you to publicly call that from anywhere, allowing you to communicate with your module from any other module. So this framework is quite flexible. Then we have the Messenger library. This is another framework. I'm quite fond of this one as well. Similarly, we have tools, Messenger library, create active from template, choose your actor type, pick the one from the wizard, Give it a name, click OK, bang, new module in your project tree. Now this one, you can see, doesn't hide the fact that it's class-based. So the DQMH, if you're not happy with classes, you're not quite sure how to use them yet, um, that hides all that from you inside a library, which you might be more comfortable working with. Um, the Messenger framework, well, it doesn't care, straight away, there you go. There's a child class based on the actor class within the Messenger library, and there is one VI inside, actor. And looking at that, that's not it, clearly. <laughs> that's a cartoon of what it is essentially inside. You have an outer while loop, um, and you have an event structure on the left, which generates the jobs. And then you have a state machine on the right, which allows you to run through that state structure before we go back to the event structure. That's actually what it looks like. And the, I think one of the powers, one, uh, sorry, I think the power of the messenger library is the, the sheer variety of messaging types in there. 
Uh, there are queue based, there are event based, there are notifiers. You can bundle messages, broadcast them, you can create whatever you want because there is a massive library of message handling VIs in there. I get lost in there sometimes, it's quite deep. If you can learn to use the messenger framework, um, I think that this is probably one of the most flexible ones. But it's also slightly more advanced, I'd say, and a little bit harder to pick up. Aren't they all kind of the same? Can I? Sorry? It's supposed to be a library first. It has to do messages and do messaging patterns. Right. However, but then of course I then use it as a framework for myself. Right. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. It's called the messenger library because it's a messaging solution first. And then James built in the ability to create modules, actors, whatever you want to call them, that sit on top of that. Um, so it's kind of come into the framework world from the back door. Okay, how long have I got left? Five minutes, right. So, they're not all the same. They use different communications architectures. Uh, some of them allow you to call any module from any other module, giving you the freedom to talk from A to F, however you like. Others might use a pyramid scheme, where you have a caller at the top and it branches down. Messages only go up and down those branches. That might be quite restrictive, but it also imposes certain design restrictions that some say are the right way to develop. The technology for that communication, it might be user events, it might be queues. Um, so some of that, some people, uh, some frameworks that's hidden. Um, the level of OOP exposure, you might find that some of them immediately show you the fact that it's based on classes and you have to accept that and work with it. <coughs> Others do their best to hide that from you to perhaps make it slightly easier to adopt. Productivity tools, the two that I showed there come with tools. That's Lavi VIs with scripting inside that do a lot of the boilerplate work for you. Not all of them do come with tools. They also, some of them include additional debugging tools which allow you to help debug your code. Um, once you start using a framework, it can get a bit hard to man, uh, manage all your actors while they're running. Automated testing, I mentioned that from DQMH. And I've got three minutes left, so I'm gonna quickly go through the last few slides to try and throw some uh, attributes on some of these to help you decide which ones may or may not be the right one for you. So, cost. How much do these frameworks cost? Well, based on a scale of entirely free to, I need a mortgage application. <laughs> They're all free. Bonus. How hard will it be for me to start with one of these frameworks, to pick one of these up? So, from piece of cake, whereby the installation is handled uh, by VI Package Manager and it appears in the tools menu and there are examples and there are videos to the other end of the scale where if you might find that, oh yeah, some of that's there but I really don't get it. I don't understand. It's a real deep dive in there to understand how it works. Personally, I've found the QMH to be the simplest. That's really easy to get started with. So if you're looking for your first framework, try that. This is, sorry, Alan. <laughs> so where was I wrong? <laughs> I, I have trained, I have trained NI applications engineers with like two years experience uh -huh. in IV, starting from nothing. So they need a trainer. That's they what do you're saying. saying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not mock support. Okay. It, it is, it is attainable. A ton of, of you know, special things are what you're bringing up. Same thing. Yeah. You know, you do need to train your framework, but it's not lots of work to get there. Good. Great feedback. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is great. We have one of the core developers of the NI uh, Active Framework right. here. In I think you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I personally looked at that in 2011. Yes, yes, it's not on the right hand side every time. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I, will actually throw this, I will actually throw this out. In, in my experience, I have, I have had a harder time getting through to, to our experienced, you know, who have been using, you know, basically different frameworks yes. for an extended period of time in Labby. The more, the more you've worked with Labby, the harder it can be to transition back to framework. I've had better success with people who are starting fresh in the Labby setting. Right. So, so I'll give you that. If you're transitioning from something else, you are adjusting. Yeah. And, and that can be a challenge. Okay. 
and there's great documentation on the community. There is so much documentation. Um, I haven't looked at the active framework in, a, in about five years now, but when I, when I did look at it, it was hard. Yeah, 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 I missed the course. <laughs> and I'll quickly go through some of the others there. Um, I think there's quite a variety. Some of, so some of the easier ones are state machine objects, messenger library, officialness. All right, I've got four <laughs> seconds left, so I'll make this really quick. Um, officialness is a made up word. It's kind of, is this going to last for a long time? Has somebody done this in the bedroom? Or is it real? Does it come from a company? Um, Active Framework, ship with LabVIEW. It's there right now in your LabVIEW installation. You can start using it immediately. I have to go to the NI Tools Network to get it. DQMH, Messenger Library, DCAF. I have to go to VI Package Manager to get it. That's State Machine Objects. Uh, and then we've got Dark Website, um, Lapdog, blah. <laughs> it may not be as bad as that, really, but it's actually really hard to find those and then no, use them. <laughs> Right, I'm out of time, unfortunately. There were a few more slides. The presentation's provided. I don't know how we're gonna do that, but it'll be given to everybody. So the remaining slides, you will get to see the content. Um, level of support, I'll quickly run through. Openness, if it's really important to you to get a framework that's easy to access. Um, I've only put DQMH here because you understandably locked down some of the scripting in the tools because it was an investment and it's, they want to protect that IP. At the other end, of course, state machine objects, very open. JKI have got their online repository. They encourage you to go there, get that fork it, develop your own features and branches. I hope I've whetted at least one person's appetite and they're going <laughs> to go away and try a LabVIEW framework. Thank you very much.